Section number 42 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1812 to 1846 part 2 word of the 200 settlers having been moved from red river by the nor'westers of mcdowell's forcible expulsion and of the dispersion of the rest of the colony had of course been sent to selkirk and his agents in both montreal and london swift retaliation is prepared Colin Robertson, who speaks French like a Canadian and knows all the Norwest voyagers of the St. Lawrence, is sent to gather up two hundred French boatmen under the very noses of the Norwesters at Montreal. With these, Robertson is to invade the far-famed Athabasca, whence come the best furs, the very heart of the Norwesters' stamping ground. Robert Semple is appointed governor of the colony on Red River, with instructions to resist aggressions of the Nor'westers even to the point of a shock that may be felt from Montreal to Athabasca. Selkirk himself comes to Canada to interview the governor-general about military forces to protect his colony. Robertson, with his two hundred voyageurs for Athabasca, follows the old Ottawa trail of the French explorers, from the St. Lawrence to the Great Lakes, and from the Great Lakes to Red River by way of Minnipeg Lake. Whom does he find on the shores of the lake but Selkirk's dispersed colonists? Ordering John Clark, an old campaigner of Astor's company on the Columbia, to lead the two hundred French voyageurs on up to Athabasca, Colin Robertson rallies the colonists together and leads them back to Red River for the winter of 1815 to 1816. Feeling sure that he had destroyed Selkirk's scheme, root and branch, Cameron has remained at Fort Gibraltar with only a few men. When back to the field comes Robertson, stormy, capable, robust, red-blooded, fearless, breathing vengeance on Selkirk's foes. By the spring of 1816, the tables have been turned with a vengeance. Cameron, the Nor'wester, has been seized and sent to Hudson Bay to be expelled from the country. Fort Gibraltar has been pulled down and the timbers used to strengthen Fort Douglas, whose pointed cannon command all passage up and down Red River. It was hardly to be supposed that the haughty Nor'westers would submit to expulsion without a blow. From Athabasca, from New Cal Caledonia, from Qu'Appelle, they rally their doughtiest fighters under Cuthbert Grant, the half-breed Plain Ranger. From Montreal and Fort William come spurring the leading partners with 170 French-Canadian bullies and a brass cannon concealed under oilcloth in a long boat. The object of the Plain Rangers is to meet the upcoming partners with supplies for the year. But is that any reason for the riders who are striking eastward from Assiniboine to Red River, decking themselves out in war paint and stripping like savages before battle? The object of the partners is to meet the Plain Rangers on Red River, but is that any reason for bringing a cannon concealed under oilcloth all the way from Lake Superior? Or do men fighting a life-and-death struggle for the thing the world calls success ever acknowledge plain motives within themselves at all? Is it not rather the blind brute instinct of self-protection, forfend what may? Listen, white men, beware, beware, the Cree chief Pegwis warns Governor Semple, what means the spectacle of white brothers who preach peace, preparing for war over a few beaver pelts? Chief Pegwis cannot understand except this is the way of white men. 
and now unluckily for governor semple he quarrels with his adviser colin robertson robertson from his early training in northwest ranks reads the signs and is for striking a blow before the enemy can strike him semple is still talking peace robertson leaves red river in disgust and departs for hudson bay to take ship for england the plain rangers it may be explained have uttered the wild threat that if they can catch robertson they will avenge the destruction of fort gibraltar by skinning him alive and feeding him to the dogs also it is well known nor'westers of coppel have muttered angry prophecies about the ground being drenched with the blood of colonists still semple talks peace which is a good thing in its place but this isn't the place my governor my governor pleads an old hunter off the hudson's bay with semple are you not afraid the half-breeds are gathering to kill you semple laughs pshaw he has law on his side law what is law the old hunter of the lawless wilds doesn't know that word the word doesn't come as far west as the pays don hout it is sunset of june eighteenth eighteen sixteen old chief pegas comes again to the hudson's bay fort on red river governor of the gardeners he solemnly warns governor of the land workers and gardeners listen not much does he add after the fashion of his race only this let me bring my warriors to protect you semple laughs at such fears it is sunset of june nineteenth a soft west wind has set the prairie grass rippling like a green sea between the fort and the sun hanging low at the western skyline a boy on the lookout above one of the bastion towers of fort douglas suddenly shouts the half-breeds are coming semple ascends the tower and looks through a field glass there is a line of sixty or seventy horsemen all armed not coming to the fort but moving diagonally across from the assiniboine to the red towards the colony and then north towards the colony is wildest clamor people in ox carts people on horseback people on foot stampeding for the shelter of the fort and up to this moment absolutely nothing has occurred to create this terror let twenty men follow me orders sample and he marches out followed by twenty-seven armed men as they wade through the waist-high hay fields they meet the fleeing colonists keep your back to the river shouts one colonist conveying his family they are painted governor don't let them surround you semple sends back to the fort for a cannon to be trundled out young lieutenant holt's gun goes off by mistake semple turns on him with fury and bids him have a care there is to be no firing the half-breeds have turned from their trail and are coming forward at a gallop there's grant the plain ranger governor let me shoot him pleads one hudson's bay man god have mercy on our souls mutters one of the colonists counting the foe but we are all dead men all the world knows the rest at the knoll where grew some trees a spot now known in winnipeg on north main street as seven oaks grant the ranger sent a half-breed boucher forward to parley what do you want demands semple we want our fort go to your fort then rascal you have destroyed our fort dare you speak so to me arrest him boucher slips from his saddle the plain rangers think he has been shot instantaneously from both sides crashes musketry fire semple falls with a broken thigh before grant can control his murderous crew or obtain aid for the wounded governor a scamp of a half-breed has slashed the fallen man to death two or three hudson's bay men escape through the long grass and swim across red river two or three more save themselves by instant surrender 
For the rest of the twenty-seven they lie where they have fallen. They are stripped, mutilated, cut to pieces. Only one Nor'wester is killed, only one wounded. Later, in order to save the lives of the settlers, Fort Douglas is surrendered. For a second time the colonists are dispersed. Before going down Red River in flatboats, two of the Hudson's Bay people go out with Chief Pegasus by night and bury the dead, but they have no time to dig deep graves, and a few days later the wolves have ripped up the bodies. Near Lake Winnipeg the fleeing colonists meet the Northwest partners with one hundred and seventy men. No need to announce what the spectacle of the terrified colonists means. A wild whoop rents the air. Thank Providence it was all over before we came, writes one devotee Norwester, for we intended to storm the fort. Both crews pause. The Norwesters interrogate the settlers. Semple's private papers are seized. Also, two Hudson's Bay men who took part in the Seven Oaks fight are arrested to be carried on down to Northwest headquarters on Lake Superior. Then the settlers go on to Lake Winnipeg. At the various camping places on the way down to Fort William, those two Hudson Bay prisoners overhear strange threats. It is night on the Lake of the Woods. Voices of Northwest partners sound through the dark. They are talking of Selkirk coming to the rescue of his people with an armed force, says the wild voice of a Nor'wester whose brother had been killed by a Hudson Bay man some years before. There are fine quiet places along Winnipeg River if he comes this way, then scraps of a conversation. Then the half-breeds could capture him when he is asleep, then words too low to be heard then they could have the indians shoot him then in voice of authority restraining the wild folly of a bloodthirst for vengeance things have gone too far but we can throw the blame on the indians the wild words of a man gone mad for revenge must not be taken as the policy of a great commercial company Meantime, where is Selkirk? He had arrived in Montreal, secret courier, whose advances I had told elsewhere, had carried him word of the dangers impending over his colony. He at once appealed to the Governor-General for a military force to protect the settlers, but it must be recalled how Upper and Lower Canada were to be governed under the Act of 1791. There were to be the governor, the legislative council appointed by the crown, and the representative assembly. The legislative council was entirely dominated by the Northwest Company. Of the different Quebec courts, there was scarcely a judge who was not interested directly or indirectly in the Northwest Company. Lord Selkirk could obtain no aid which would conflict with the, that company's policy. Then Selkirk petitioned the governor that, in view of the threats against himself, he might be granted the commission of a justice of the peace, and permission to take a personal bodyguard at his own cost to the West. These requests the governor granted. Thereupon Selkirk gathers up some two hundred of the de Muron and de Watville regiments, mercenaries disbanded after the war of 1812 and sets out for the west not aware that robertson has left red river he sends him word to keep the colonists together and to expect help by way of the states from the salt in order to avoid touching the nor'westers post at fort william the courier with this message is waylaid by the nor'westers but selkirk himself preceded by his former governor, Miles MacDonnell, has gone only as far as assault when word comes back of the Seven Oaks Massacre. What to do now? He can obtain no justice in eastern Canada. Two justices of the peace at the salt refuse to be involved in the quarrel by accompanying him. Selkirk goes on without them, accompanied by the two hundred hired soldiers. 
but instead of proceeding to red river by minnesota as he had first planned he strikes straight for fort william the headquarters of the nor'westers he arrives at the fort august twelfth only a few days after the northwest partners had come down from the scene of the massacre at red river cannon are planted opposite fort william things have gone too far the nor'westers capitulate without a stroke then as justice of the peace my lord selkirk arrests all the partners but one and sends them east to stand trial for the massacre of seven oaks the one partner not sent east was a fuddled old drunkard long since retired from active work this man now executes a deed of sale to my lord selkirk for fort william and its furs the man was so intoxicated that he could not write so the aforetimed governor miles macdonnell writes out the bargain which one could wish so great a philanthropist as selkirk had not touched with tongs before midwinter of eighteen seventeen had passed the de Muron soldiers have crossed minnesota and gone down red river to fort douglas one stormy night they scale the wall and bundle the northwest serps out bag and baggage july eighteen seventeen comes selkirk himself to the promised land there is no record that i have been able to find of his thoughts on first nearing the ground for which so much blood had been shed and for which he himself was yet to suffer much but one can venture to say that his most daring hope did not grasp the empire that was to grow from the seed he had planted he meets the indians in treaty for their lands he greets his colonists in the open one sunny august day speaking personally to each and deeding over to them land free of all charge this land i give you for your church he said standing on the ground which the cathedral now occupies that plot shall be for your school pointing across the gully and in memory of your native land let the parish be called kildonan of the trials and counter trials between the two companies there is not space to tell here selkirk was forced to pay heavy damages for his course at fort william but the courts of eastern canada record not a single conviction against the nor'westers for the massacre of seven oaks selkirk retired shattered in health to europe where he died in eighteen twenty the same year passed away alexander mackenzie his old-time rival the truth is each company had gone too far and was on the verge of ruin from athabasca came the furs that prevented bankruptcy and whichever company could drive the other from athabasca could practically force its rival to ruin or union when colin robertson had rallied the dispersed colonists from lake winnipeg he had left john clark to conduct the two hundred canadian voyageurs to athabasca for the hudson's bay company clark had been a nor'wester before he joined astor and was a born fighter idolized by the indians so confident was he of a success now that he galloped his canoes up the saskatchewan without pause to gather provisions once on the ground of athabasca lake he divided his party into two or three bands and sent them foraging to the nor'westers forts and hunting grounds up peace river down slave lake at athabasca itself weakened by division and without food to keep together his men fell easy prey to the wily northwesters of those on slave lake eighteen died from starvation those on peace river were captured and literally whipped out of the country signing oaths never to return those at athabasca being leading officers were held prisoners meanwhile the hudson's bay company is defeated at seven oaks and victorious at fort william the nor'westers at athabasca were keen to keep the frightened indians of the north ignorant that selkirk had triumphed at fort william but the news travelled over the two thousand miles of prairie 
in that strange hunter fashion known as moccasin telegram and the story is told how the captured hudson's bay officers let the secret out for the benefit of the indians now afraid to carry their hunt to a hudson's bay man revels and all-night carousals marked the winter with the triumphant nor'westers of athabasca lake often when wild drinking songs were ringing in the nor'westers dining hall the hudson's bay men would be brought in to furnish a butt for their merciless victors one night when the hall was full of indians one of the northwest bullies began to brawl out a song in celebration of the seven oaks affair the h b c came up a hill and up a hill they came the h b c came up a hill but down they went again tired of their rude horseplay one of the hudson's bay officers spoke up ye never asked me for a song i have a verse o me and compassion then to the utter amaze of the drunken listeners and astonishment of the indians the game old officer trolled off this stave but selkirk brave went up a hill and to fort williams came when in he popped and out from the thence he could not be driven again the thunderstruck nor'wester leapt to his feet with a yell a hundred guineas for the name of the man who brought the news here a hundred guineas for twa lines of me in compassion extravagant sir returned the canny scot from accounts held by the hudson's bay company's montreal lawyers it is seen that clark's expedition cost the company twenty thousand pounds End of section 42. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 43 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1812 to 1846, Part 3 Before the massacre of Seven Oaks, Colin Robertson had gone down to Hudson Bay in high dungeon with Semple, intending to take ship for England but the fall of ice drive prevented one ship from leaving the bay and robertson was stranded at moose factory for the winter whither couriers brought him word of the seven oats tragedy and selkirk's victory at fort william taking an indian for guide robertson set out on snowshoes for montreal following the old ottawa trail traversed by radisson and iberville long ago montreal he found in a state of turmoil almost verging on riot over the imprisonment of the northwest partners whom selkirk had sent east nightly the goals were illuminated as for festivals nightly sound of wandering musicians came from the cell windows where loyal friends were serenading the imprisoned partners they were released, of course, and acquitted from the charge of responsibility for the massacre of Seven Oaks. Presently Robertson finds himself behind the bars for his part in destroying Fort Gibraltar and arresting Duncan Cameron. He too is acquitted, and he tells us frankly that a private arrangement has been made beforehand with the presiding judge probably if the nor'westers had been as frank the same influence would explain their acquittal robertson found himself free just about the time lord selkirk came back from red river by way of the mississippi in order to avoid those careful plans for his welfare on the part of the nor'westers at the quiet places along winnipeg river 
the governor of canada had notified members of both companies unofficially that the english government advised the rivals to find some basis of union which practically meant that if the investigations under way were pushed to extremes both sides might find themselves in awkward plight but the fight had gone beyond the period of pure commercialism it was now a matter of deadly personal hate between man and man which i am sorry to say has been carried down by the descendants of the old fighters almost to the present day each side hoped to drive the other to bankruptcy and the last throes of the deadly struggle were to be in athabasca the richest fur field while selkirk is fighting his cause in the courts he gives robertson carte blanche to gather two hundred more french voyageurs and proceed to athabasca midsummer of eighteen nineteen finds the stalwart robertson crossing lake winnipeg to ascend the saskatchewan at the mouth of the saskatchewan is a miserable remnant of terrified men from the last athabasca expedition is added to robertson's party and john clark breathing death and destruction against the nor'westers goes along as lieutenant to robertson everywhere are signs of the lawless conditions of the fur trade not an indian dare speak to a hudson's bay man on pain of horsewhipping instead of canoes gliding up and down the saskatchewan like birds of passage reign a silence and solitude of the dead though robertson bids his voyageurs sing and fire off muskets as signals for trade not a soul comes down to the river banks till the fleet of advancing traders is well away from the saskatchewan and halfway across the height of land towards the athabasca the amazement of the northwesters at fort chippewan in athabasca when robertson pulled ashore at the conglomeration of huts known as fort wedderburn may be guessed two or three of the partners ran down to the shore and called out that they would like to parley but john clark filled with memory of a former outrage and rocking the canoe in his fury so that it almost upset met the overtures with a volley of stenorian abuse that sent the nor'westers scampering and set robertson laughing till the tears ran down his cheeks the change of spirit on part of the nor'westers was easily explained the most of their men were absent on the hunting field in a few weeks robertson had his huts in order and had dispatched his trappers down to slave lake and westward up peace river then in october came more nor'west partners from montreal the nor'westers were stronger now and not so peacefully inclined nightly the french bullies well plied with whiskey would come across to the hudson's bay fort bawling out challenge to fight but robertson held his men in hand and kept his powder dry early on the morning of october eleventh robertson's valet roused him from bed with word that a man had been accidentally shot slipping a pistol in his pocket and all unsuspicious of trickery robertson dashed out it happened that the most of his men were at a slight distance from his fort before they could rally to his rescue he was knocked down disarmed surrounded by nor'westers thrown into a boat and carried back to their fort a captive in vain he stormed almost apoplectic with rage and tried to send back indian messengers to his men the nor'westers laughed at him good-naturedly and regulated him to quarters in one room of a long hut where sole furnishings were a berth bed and a fireplace without a floor robertson's only possessions in captivity were the clothes on his back a jackknife a small pencil and a notebook but he probably consoled himself that his men were now on guard and outnumbering the nor'westers two to one could hold the ground for the hudson's bay that winter 
as time passed the captive robertson began to rack his brains how to communicate with his men it was a drinking age and the fur traders had the reputation of capacity to drink any other class of men off their legs robertson feigned an unholy thirst rapping for his guard he requested that messages might be sent across to the hudson's bay fort for a keg of liquor it can be guessed how readily the northwesters complied but robertson took good care when the guard was absent and the door locked to pour out most of the whiskey on the earth floor then taking sips of paper from his notebook he cut them in strips the width of a spool on these he wrote cipher and mysterious instructions which only his men could understand giving full information of the northwesters movements bidding his people hold their own and ordering them to send messages down to the new hudson's bay governor at red river william williams to place his demoron soldiers in ambush along the grand rapids of the saskatchewan to catch the northwest partners on their way to montreal next spring these slips of paper he rolled up tight as a spool and hammered into the bunghole of the barrel then he plastered clay all over to hide the paper and bade the guard carry this keg of whiskey back to the h b c fort for it was musty robertson complained let the men rinse out the keg and put in a fresh supply all that winter robertson the hudson's bay man captive in the nor'westers fort sent weekly commands to his men by means of the whiskey kegs but in the spring his trick was discovered and the angry nor'westers decided he was too clever a man to be kept on the field they would ship him out of the country when their furs were sent east on the way east he succeeded in escaping at cumberland house waiting only a few hours he launched out in his canoe and followed on the trail of the northwest partners on down to see what would happen at grand rapids where the saskatchewan flows into lake winnipeg a jubilant shout from a canoe turning a bend in the river presently announced the news all the northwest partners captured when robertson came to grand rapids he found governor williams and the demurons in possession cannon pointed across the river below the rapids the northwest partners were prisoners in a hut the voyageurs were allowed to go on down to montreal with the furs this last act in the great struggle ended tragically enough what was to be done with the captured partners they could not be sent to eastern canada pending investigations for the union of the companies governor williams sent them to york factory hudson's bay whence some took ship to england others set out overland on snowshoes for canada but in the scuffle at grand rapids frobisher one of the oldest partners with a reputation of great cruelty in his treatment of hudson's bay men had been violently clubbed on the head with a gun from that moment he became a raving maniac and the hudson's bay people did not know what to do with such a captive he must not be permitted to go home to england his condition was too terrible evidence against them so they kept him prisoner in the outhouses of york factory with two faithful nor'wester half-breeds as personal attendants one dark cold night towards the first of october forbisher succeeded in escaping through the broken bars of his cell window a leap took him over the pickets by chance an old canoe lay on hayes river with this he began to ascend stream for the interior paddling wildly laughing wildly raving and singing the two half-breeds knew that a voyage to the interior at this season without snowshoes food or heavy clothing meant certain death but they followed their master faithfully as black slaves wherever night found them they turned the canoe upside down and slept under it 
fish lines supplied food and the deserted hut of some hunter occasionally gave them shelter for the night winter set in early the ice edging of the river cut the birch canoe abandoning it they went forward on foot from york fort hudson bay the nearest northwest post was seven hundred miles by the end of october they had not gone half the distance then came one of those changes so frequent in northern climes a sunburst of warm weather following the first early winter turning all frozen fields to swimming marshes and the travelers had no canoe by this time frobisher was too weak to walk as his body failed his mind rallied and he begged the two half-breeds to go on without him as delay meant the death of all three but the faithful fellows carried him by turns on their backs they themselves were now so emaciated they were making but a few miles a day their moccasins had been worn to tatters and all three looked more like skeletons than living men then the third week of november frobisher could go no farther and the servant's strength failed building a fire in a sheltered place for their master the two faithful fellows left frobisher somewhere west of lake winnipeg two days later they crept into a northwest post too weak to speak and handed the northwesters a note scrawled by frobisher asking them to send a rescue party frobisher was found lying across the ashes of the fire life was extinct in eighteen twenty the union of the companies put an end to the ruinous and criminal struggle george simpson afterwards knighted who had been sent to look over matters in athabasca is appointed governor and nicholas gary one of the london directors comes out to appoint the officers of the united companies to their new districts the scene is one for artist brush the last meeting of the partners at fort william hudson's bay men and nor'westers such deadly enemies they would not speak sitting in the great dining hall glowering at each other across tables george simpson at one end of the tables pompously dressed in ruffles and satin coat and silk breeches vainly endeavoring to keep up suave conversation nicholas gary at the other end of the table also very pompous and smooth but with a look on his face as if he were sitting above a powder mine the highland pipers dressed in tartans standing at each end of the hall filling the room with the drone and skirl of the bagpipes by the union of the companies both sides avoided proving their rights in the law courts most important of all the hudson's bay company escaped proving its charter valid for the charter applied only to hudson bay and adjacent lands not occupied by other christian powers but on the union taking place the british government granted to the new hudson's bay company license of exclusive monopoly to all the indian territory meaning one hudson bay country two the interior three new caledonia as well as oregon in fact the union left the fur traders ten times more strongly entrenched than before by this new arrangement dr john mclaughlin was appointed new chief factor of the western territories known as oregon and new caledonia when the war of eighteen twelve closed treaty provided that oregon should be open to the joint occupancy of english and american traders till the matter of the western boundary could be finally settled oregon roughly included all territory between the columbia and the spanish fort at san francisco namely washington oregon northern california idaho utah nevada parts of montana and wyoming it was cheaper to send provisions round by sea to the fur posts of new caledonia in modern british columbia then across the continent by way of the saskatchewan so mclaughlin's district also included all the territory as far as the russian possessions in alaska 
this part of the hudson's bay company's history belongs to the united states rather than canada but it is interesting to remember that just as the french fur traders explored the mississippi far south as the gulf of mexico so english fur traders first explored the western states far south as new spain this western field was perhaps the most picturesque of all the hudson's bay company's possessions fort vancouver ninety miles inland from the sea on the columbia was the capital of this transmontane kingdom and yearly till eighteen forty six the fur brigades set out from fort vancouver two or three hundred strong by pack-horse and canoe well-known officers became regular leaders of the different brigades there was ross who led the rocky mountain brigade inland across the divide to the buffalo ranges of montana there was ogden son of the chief justice in montreal who led the southern brigade up snake river to salt lake and the nevada desert and humboldt river and mount shasta all of which regions except salt lake he was first to discover there was tom mckay son of the mckay who had crossed to the pacific with mackenzie who dressed as a spanish cavalier led the pack-horse brigades down the coast past the rogue river indians and the klamath lakes to san francisco where dr glenn ray had opened a fort for the hudson's bay company then there was the new caledonia brigade two hundred strong was set out from fort vancouver up the columbia in canoes to the scream of the bagpipes through the rocky canyons of the river close to the boundary shift was made from canoe to pack horse and leaving the columbia the brigade struck up the okanagan valley to kamloops bound for the bridal trail up the fraser river this brigade in later days was under douglas who became the knighted governor of british columbia tricked out in gay ribbons the long file of pack, pack ponies two hundred with riders two hundred more with packs moved slowly along the forest trail with a drone as of bees humming in midsummer so well did ponies know the way that riders often fell asleep to be suddenly jarred awake by the horses jamming against a tree or running under a low branch to bush riders off or hurdle jumping over a windfall each of these brigades had has its own story and each story would fill a book for instance glen ray at san francisco has a difficult mission the company has a plan to take over the debts of mexico to british capitalists and exchange them for california glen ray is sent to watch matters but he commits the blunder of furnishing arms to the losing side of a revolution the debt for arms remains unpaid glen ray suicides and the company withdraws from california presently come american settlers and missionaries over the mountains the american government delays settling that treaty of joint occupancy for the more american settlers that come the stronger will be the american claim to the territory mclaughlin helps the settlers who would have starved without his aid and mclaughlin receives such sharp censure from his company for this that he resigns when the american settlers set up a provisional government the foolish cry is raised fifty four forty or fight which means the americans claim all the way up to alaska and for this there is no warrant either through their own occupation or discovery the boundary is compromised by the treaty of oregon in eighteen forty six at the forty ninth parallel when settlers come fur-bearing animals leave long ago the hudson's bay company had foreseen the end and moved the capital of its pacific empire up to victoria a string of fur posts extends up the fraser river to new caledonia end of section forty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Section number 44 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1820 to 1867 part one it will be recalled that on the coming of the united empire loyalists to canada the form of government was changed by the constitutional act of 1791 dividing the country into upper and lower canada the government of each province to consist of a governor the legislative council and the assembly Unfortunately, self-government for the colonies was not yet a recognized principle of English rule. While the assemblies of the two provinces were elected by the people, the power of the assemblies was practically a blank, for the governor and council were the real rulers, and they were appointed by the crown, which meant Downing Street, which meant in turn that the two Canadas were regarded as the happy hunting ground for incompetent office seekers of the great English parties. From the Governor General to the most insignificant postal clerk, all were appointed from Downing Street. Influence, not merit, counted, which perhaps explains why one can count on the fingers of one hand the number of governors and lieutenants from 1791 to 1841 who were worthy of their trust and did not disgrace their position by blunders that were simply notorious. Prevost's disgraceful retreat from Lake Champlain in the War of 1812 is a typical example of the mischief a political jobber can work when placed in a position of trust, but the life-and-death struggle of the war prevented the people turning their attention to questions of misgovernment and it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the Act of 1791 reduced Canadian affairs to the chaos of a second Ireland and retarded the progress of the country for a century. It has become customary for English writers to slur over the disorders of 1837 as the results of the ignorant rabble following the bad advice of the hotheads. Mackenzie and Papineau, but it is worth remembering that everything the rabble fought for and hanged for has since been incorporated in Canada's constitution as the very wolf and warp of responsible government. Let us see how the system worked out in detail. After the War of 1812, Prevost dies before court-martial can pronounce on his misconduct at Plattsburgh, and Sir Gordon Drummond, the hero of Fort Erie siege, is sworn in. Canada is governed from Downing Street, and it is my Lord Bathurst's brilliant idea that forever after the war there shall be a belt of twenty miles left waste forest and prairie between Canada and the United States, presumably to prevent democracy rolling across the northern boundary. Fortunately, the rough horse sense of the frontiersman is wiser than the wisdom of the British statesman, and settlement continues along the boundary in spite of Bathurst's brilliant idea. Those who fought in the War of 1812 are to be rewarded by grants of land, rewarded, of course, by the crown, which means the governor, but the governor must listen to the advice of his councillors, who are appointed for life, and to the heroes of 1812 the councillors grant fifty acres apiece, while to themselves the said councillors vote grants of land running from 20,000 to 80,000 acres apiece. After the war it is agreed that neither Canada nor the United States shall keep war vessels on the lakes, except such cruisers as shall be necessary to maintain order among the fisheries, 
but the credit for this wise arrangement does not belong to the councils at Toronto or Quebec, for the suggestions came from Washington. As the legislative councillors are appointed for life, they control enormous patronage, recommending all appointments to government positions and meeting any applicants for office who are outside the family ring, with the curt refusal that has become famous for its insolence, no one but a gentleman. Judges are appointed by favour, so are local magistrates, so are collectors at the different ports of entry. Smaller cities like Kingston are year after year refused incorporation because incorporation would confer self-government, and that would oust members of the family compact who held positions in these places. Office holders are responsible to the Crown only, not to the people. Therefore, when Receiver General Cadwell of Quebec does away with 96,000 pounds, or two years' revenue of Lower Canada, he accounts for the defecation to his friends with the ex explanation of unlucky investments, and goes scot-free. Quebec is a French province, but appointments are made in England, so that out of £71,000 paid to its several servants, £58,000 go to the English office holders, £13,000 to French, out of thirty-six thousand pounds paid to judges, only eight thousand pounds go to the French. And in Upper Canada, Ontario, it was even worse. In Quebec there was always the division of French against English, and Catholic against Protestant. But in Upper Canada, the family compact of councillors against commoners was a solid and unbroken ring. When the assembly raises objections to some items of expense set down by the council, writes Lieutenant Governor Simcoe in high dungeon, I will send the rascals, meaning the commoners, packing about their business, and he prorogues the house. Not all the governors and their lieutenants are foolishly blind to the faults of the system as Simcoe of Ontario. Sir John Sherbrook of Quebec, who succeeds Drummond in Lower Canada, knows very well he is surrounded by a pack of thieves, but they are his counsellors, appointed for life, and there he is, bound to abide by their advice. Nevertheless, he kicks over traces vigorously now and then, like the old war-horse that he is. The commissary general comes to him with word that six hundred pounds is missing from the military chest, and he needs a warrant for search. Search indeed, roars Sir John, there's not the slightest need. Wherever there is a robbery in your department, it is among yourselves. Go find it. Curious it is how good men reared in the old school where the masses exist for the benefit of the classes, and the governed are to be allowed to exist only by favour of those who govern, curious how men fail to read the sign of the times. Colonel Tom Talbot's settlement in West Ontario has, by 1832, increased to 50,000 people, and the mad harem scarum of court days is becoming an old man. Talbot has been a legislative councillor for life, but it is not on record that he ever attended the council in Toronto. Still he views with high disfavour this universal discontent with being governed. The secret meetings held to agitate for responsible government, Tom Talbot regards as a pestilence leading on to the worst disease from which humanity can suffer, namely democracy. The old bear stirs uneasily in his lair, as reports come in of louder and louder demands that the colony shall be permitted to govern itself. What would become of kings and colonels and land grants by special favour if colonies governed themselves? 
Colonel Tom Talbot doffs his homespun and his coon cap, and he dons the satin ruffles of twenty-five years ago, and he mounts his steed, and he rides pompously forth to the marketplace of St. Thomas Town on St. George's Day of 1832. Bands play, flags wave, the country people from twenty miles round come riding to town. Banners inscribed with loyalty to the constitution are carried at the head of parades the venerable old colonel is greeted with burst after burst of shouting as he comes prancing on horseback up the hill the band plays the british grenadiers the highland bagpipes skirl a welcome then the old man mounts the rostrum and delivers a speech that ought to be famous as an exposition of good old tory doctrine some black sheep have slipped into my flock and very black they are and what is worse they have got the rot a distemper not known in this settlement till some i shall call for short rebels began their work of darkness under cover of organizing blanked cold water drinking societies where they meet at night to communicate their poisonous schemes and circulate the infection and delude the unwary then they assumed a more daring aspect under mask of a grievance petition which when it was placed before me i would not take the trouble to read being aware it was trash founded on falsehood fabricated to create discontent at the end of a half-hour's tirade of which these lines are a sample the good old tory raised his hands and in the words of the church's benediction blessed his people and prayed heaven to keep their minds untainted by sedition looking back less than a century it is almost impossible to believe that the colonel's speech it cannot be called reasoning was applauded to the echo and regarded as a masterly justification of people being governed rather than governing themselves perhaps after all it was not so much the constitution of canada that caused the conflict as the clash between the old-time feudalism and the spirit of modern aggressive democracy the united states fought this question out in 1776 canada wrestled it cannot be called a fight the same question out in 1837 it is necessary to give one or two cases of individual persecution to understand how the disorders flamed to open rebellion one matthews an officer of the 1812 war living on a pension had incurred the distrust of the governing ring by expressing sympathy with the agitators. Now to be an agitator was bad enough in the eyes of the family compact, but for one of their own social circle to sympathize with the outsiders was snobbercacy clique of the little city of ten thousand at Toronto, almost an unpardonable sin. Such sins were punished by social ostracism, by the grand dames of Toronto not inviting the officer's wife to social functions by the families of the upper clique literally freezing the sinner's children out of the foremost circles of social life many a canadian family is proud to trace lineage back to some old lady of this temptuous period whose only claim to recognition is that she waged pretty persecution against the heroes of canadian progress now the annals of the times do not record that this special sinner's wife and children so suffered at all events matthew's spirits were not cast down by social sobbery he continued to sympathize with the agitators the family compact bided their time and their time came a few months later when a company of american actors came to toronto a band concert had been given when the british national air struck up all hats were off then someone called for yankee doodle and in compliment to the visitors 
when the American air struck up, Matthew shouted out for hats off. For this sin, the legislative council ordered the lieutenant governor to cut off Matthew's pension, and, to the everlasting shame of Sir Peregrine Maitland, the advice was taken, though Matthews had twenty-seven years of service to his credit. Matthews appealed to England, and his pension was restored, so that, in this case, the family compact, for political reasons, was pretending to be more British than Great Britain. It was not to be the last occasion on which the loyalty cry was to be used as political dodge. The persecution of Robert Gourlay was yet more outrageous. He had come to Canada soon after the War of 1812, and in the course of collecting statistics for a book on the colony was quick to realize how Canada's progress was being literally gagged by the policy of the ruling clique. Gourlay attacked the local magistrates in the press. He pointed out that the land grants were notorious. He had advocated bombarding the evils from two sides at once by appealing to the home government and by holding local conventions of protest. The pass to which things had come may be realized by the attitude of the council. It held that the colony must hold no communications with the imperial government except through the governor-general. In other words, individual appeals not passing through the hands of the legislative council were to be regarded as illegal. It is sad to have to acknowledge that such a palpably dishonest measure was ever countenanced by people in the right minds. But the family compact went a step farther. It passed an order forbidding meetings to discuss public grievances. This part of Canada's story reads more like Russia than America, and shows to what length men will go when special privileges rather than equal rights prevail in a country. Gourlay met these infamous measures by penning some witty doggerel headed gagged gagged by Jingo. The editor in whose paper Gourlay's writings had appeared was arrested and the offending sheet was compelled to suspend. Gourlay himself is arrested for sedition and libel at least four times, but each time the jury acquits him. At any cost the governing clique must get rid of this scribbling fellow, whose pen voices the rising discontent. An alien act passed before the War of 1812 compelling the deportation of sedious persons is revived under the terms of the act gourlay is arrested tried and sentenced to be exiled but gourlay declares he is not an alien he is a british subject and he refuses to leave the country he is thrown in jail at niagara and for a year and a half left in a mouldy close cell one dislikes to write that this outrage on British justice was perpetrated under Chief Justice Powell, whose failure to obtain decisions from the jury in the Red River trials brought down such harsh criticism on the bench. At the end of twenty months, Gourlay is again hauled before the jury and sentenced to deportation on pain of death if he refuses. He was calmly asked if he had anything to say, if there was any reason why sentence should not be pronounced. Anything to say? Any reason why sentence should not be pronounced? From 1818 to 1820, Gourlay had been having things to say, had been giving good and sufficient reasons why sentence should not be pronounced. The question is repeated. Robert Gourlay, stand up. Have you anything to say? The court waits. Chief Justice Powell, bewigged and wearing his grandest manner, all unconscious that the scene is to go down to history with a blot of ignominy against his name, not Gourlay's. Gourlay's face twitches, and he breaks into shrieks of manacle laughter. 
the petty persecutions of a provincial tyranny have driven a man who is true patriot out of his mind as gourlay drops out of canada's story here it may be added that the english government later pronounced the whole trial an outrage and gourlay was invited back to canada if at this stage a man had come to canada as governor big enough and just enough to realize that colonies had some rights there might have been remedy for this imperial government eager to right the wrong was misled by the legislative councillors and all at sea as to the source of the trouble while men were being actually driven out of canada by the governing ring on the charge of disloyalty the colonel minister of england was sending secret dispatches to the governor-general instructing him plainly that if independence was what canada wanted then the mother country rather than risk a second war with the united states or press conclusions with canada themselves would wittingly cede independence it is as well to be empathetic and clear on this point it was not the tyranny of england that caused the troubles of eighteen thirty seven it was the dishonesty of the ruling rings at quebec and toronto and this dishonesty with was possible because of the constitutional act of seventeen ninety one unfortunately just when imperial statesmen of the modern school were needed governors of the old school were appointed to canada after sir john sherbrooke came the duke of richmond to quebec and his son-in-law sir peregrine maitland as lieutenant governor to ontario men of more courtly manners never graced the viceregal chairs of quebec and toronto richmond who was some fifty years of age had won notoriety in his early days by a duel with a prince of the blood royal honor on both sides being satisfied by richmond shooting away a curl from the royal brow but presto an irish barrister takes up the quarrel by challenging richmond to a second duel for having dared to fight a prince and here richmond satisfies claims of honor by a well-directed ball aimed to wound not kill long years after when the duke became viceroy of ireland the irishman appeared at one of richmond's state balls ha laughed the barrister the last time we met your grace gave me a ball best give you a brace of em now retorted the witty richmond and he sent his quodam foe invitation to two more balls richmond it was who gave the famous ball before the defeat of napoleon at waterloo the story of his daughter's love match with sir pegreen maitland is a piece with rest of the romance in richmond's life richmond and mate had been friends in the army but when the duke began to observe that his daughter lady sarah and the younger man were falling in love he thought to discourage the union with a poor man by omitting maitland's name from invitation lists when lady sarah came downstairs to a ball she surmised that maitland had not been invited and withdrawing from the assembled guests drove to her lover's apartments she married maitland without her father's consent but a reconciliation had been patched up father and son-in-law now came to canada as governor and lieutenant governor the military and social life of both unfitted them to appreciate the conditions of canada socially both were the lions of the hour a man and gentleman richmond was simply adored and quebec's love of all the pomp and monarchy was glutted to the full no more distinguished governor ever played host in the old shadow st louis but as rulers as pacifiers as guides of the ship of state richmond and maitland were dismal failures to them canada's demand for responsible government seemed the rallying cry of an impending republic we must overcome democracy or it will overcome us pronounced richmond 
he failed to see that resistance to the demand for self-government would bring about the same results in canada as resistance had brought about in the united states and if he could not guess for the thing was new in the world's history that the grant of self-government would but bind the colony the closer to the motherland it is sad to write of two such high-minded well-intentioned rulers that the worst acts of misgovernment in canada took place in their regime end of section 44 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section number 45 of canada the empire of the north this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc canada the empire of the north by agnes c lott from 1820 to 1867 part two richmond's death was as unusual as his life two accounts are given of the cause one states that he permitted a pet dog to touch a cut in his face the other account has it that he was bitten by a tame fox at a fair in sorrel and the date of richmond's death late in august of 1819 exactly two months from the time he was bitten at sorel which is the length of time that hydrophobia takes to develop in a grown person would seem to substantiate the latter story he was traveling on horseback from perth to richmond on the ottawa and had complained of feeling poorly a small stream had to be crossed the sight of the stream brought the strange water delirium to richmond when he begged his attendants to take him quickly to montreal it needs scarcely to be explained here that hydrophobia is not caused by lack of water but by contagious transmission the feeling passed as the first terrors of the disease are usually spasmodic and the governor was proceeding through the woods with his attendants when he suddenly broke away deliriously leading them a wild race to a farm shed there he died during the night, crying out as the lucid intervals broke the delirium of his agonies. For shame, for shame, Lennox! Richmond, be a man! Can you not bear it? Public affairs are meanwhile passing from bad to worse. William Lyon Mackenzie has become leader of the agitators in his newspaper, The Advocate of Toronto. A band of young vandals sons of the ruling clique wreck his newspaper office and throw the type into toronto bay but mackenzie recovers three thousand dollar damages and goes on agitating four times he is publicly expelled from the house and four times he is returned by the electors what they are asking these agitators branded as rebels expelled from the assembly in some cases cast in prison by the councillors, in others threatened with death. Control of public revenues, reform in the land system, municipal rights for towns and cities, the exclusion of judges from Parliament, that the council be directly responsible to the people rather than the Crown. Since 1818 the reformers have been agitating to have wrongs righted and for nineteen years the clique has prevented official inquiry, gagged the press, bludgeoned conventions out of existence, and thrown leaders of opposition in prison. Mackenzie now makes the mistake of publishing in his papers a letter from the English radical Hume, advocating the freedom of Canada, from the baneful domination of the mother country. At once, with a jingo whoop, the loyalty cry is emitted by the family compact it is not this what they have been telling the governor from the first these reformers are republicans in disguise 
by trickery and manipulation they swing the next election so that mackenzie is defeated from that moment mackenzie's tone changed it may be that losing all hope of reform he became a republican if this were treason then the english ministers who were advocating the same remedy were guilty of the same treason with mackenzie secretly and openly are a host of sympathizers dr rolfe tom tabot's old friend come up from the london district to practice medicine in toronto and van egmond who has helped to settle the huron tract of the canada company founded by john galt the novelist and some four thousand others whose names mackenzie has on a list in his carpet bag all the autumn of eighteen thirty seven fitzgibbons now commander of the troops in toronto hears vague rumors of farmers secretly drilling of workmen extemporizing swords out of skies of old soldiers furbishing up their arms of the eighteen twelve war what does it mean sir francis bonhead the new governor of ontario refuses to believe his own ears neither does the family compact realize that there is any danger to their long tenure of power they affect to sneer at those poor patriots of the plough little dreaming that the rights which those poor patriots of the scythe swords are burning to defend will by and by be the pride of england's colonial system the story of plot and counterplot cannot be told in detail here it is too long but on the night of monday december fourth toronto wakes up to a wild ringing of college bells the rebel patriots have collected at montgomery's tavern outside toronto and are advancing on the city poor mackenzie's plans have gone all awry four thousand patriots have pledged themselves to assemble at the tavern on december seventh but dr rolfe or some other friend in the city sends word that the date has been discovered the only hope of seizing the city is for them to come sooner and mackenzie arrives at the tavern on december third with only a few hundred followers who have neither food nor firearms and i doubt much if they had even definite plans of such there are no records before van egmond comes from seaforth doubt and dissension and distrust of success depress the insurgents and it doesn't help their spirits any to have four toronto scouts break through their lines in the dark and back again with word of their weakness though they plant a fatal bullet neatly in the back of one poor loyalist if they had advanced promptly on the fourth as planned they might have given sir francis bonhead and fitzgibbons a stiff tussle for possession of the city for toronto's defenders at this time numbered scarcely three hundred but during the days mackenzie's followers delayed north of young street allan mcnab came up from hamilton with more troops by wednesday the sixth there were twelve hundred loyalist troops in toronto and noon of the seventh out marches the loyalist army by way of young street bands playing flags flying horses prancing under fitzgibbons and mcnab it was a warm sunny day from the windows of young street women waved handkerchiefs and cheered at street corners the rabble shouted itself hoarse just as it would have cheered mackenzie had he come down young street victorious mackenzie's sentries had warned the insurgents of the loyalists coming mackenzie was for immediate advance van egmond thought it stark madness for five hundred poorly armed men to meet twelve hundred troopers in pitched battle but it was too late now for stark madness to retreat the loyalist bands could be heard from rosedale the loyalist bayonets could be seen glittering in the sun mackenzie posted his men a short distance south of the tavern in some woods one hundred and fifty on one side on the road west of young street 
one hundred on the other side. The rest of the insurgents, being without arms, did not leave the rendezvous. In the confusion and haste the tragic mistake was made of leaving Mackenzie's carpet-bag with the list of patriots at the tavern. This gave the loyalists a complete roster of the agitators' names. Fifteen minutes later it was all over with Mackenzie. The big guns of the Toronto troops shelled the woods, killing one patriot rebel and wounding eleven, four fatally. In answer, only a clattering spatter of shots came from the rebel side. The patriots were in headlong fight with the mounted men of Toronto in pursuit. It was over with Mackenzie, but, as the sequence of events will show, it was not all over with the cause. A book of soldiers' yarns might be told of hairbreadth escapes, the aftermath of the rebellion. Knowing his side was doomed to defeat, Dr. Rolfe tried to escape from Toronto. He was stopped by a loyalist sentry, but explained he was leaving the city to visit a patient. Farther on he had been arrested by a loyalist picket when luckily a young doctor who had attended Rolfe's medical lectures, all unconscious of Mackenzie's plot, vouched for his loyalty. Riding like a madman all that night, Rolfe reached Niagara and escaped to the American frontier. A reward of one thousand pounds had been offered for Mackenzie, dead or alive. He had waited only till his followers fled, when he mounted his big bay horse and gallop for the woods, pursued by Fitzgibbon's men. The big bay carried him safely to the country, where he wandered openly for four days. It speaks volumes for the staunch fidelity of the country people to the cause which Mackenzie represented, that during these wanderings he was unbetrayed, spite of the one thousand pounds reward. Finally, he too succeeded in crossing Niagara. Then Egmont was captured north of Young Street, but died from disease contracted in his prison cell before he could be tried. Lount, another of the leaders, had succeeded in reaching Long Point, Lake Erie. With a fellow patriot, a French voyageur, and a boy, he started to cross Lake Erie in an open boat. It was wintry, stormy weather. For two days and two nights the boat tossed, a plaything of the waves, the drenching spray freezing as it fell, till the craft was almost ice-logged. For food they had brought only a small piece of meat, and this had frozen so hard that their numb hands could not break it. Weakening at each oar-stroke, they had at last saw the south shore of Lake Erie rise on the skyline. But before the close muffled refugees had dared to hope for safety on the American side, a strong south wind had sprung up that dove the boat back across the lake towards Grand River. To remain exposed longer meant certain death. They landed, were mistaken for smugglers, and thrown into jail, where Lount was at once recognized. In West Ontario one Dr. Ducombe had acted as Mackenzie's lieutenant. Allan McNabb had come west with six hundred men to suppress the rebellion. Realizing the hopelessness of further resistance, Ducombe had tried to save his men by ordering them to disperse to their homes. He himself, with his white horse, took to the woods where he lay in hiding all day, and it was a Canadian December and foraged at night for berries and roots. Judge Ermetener gives the graphic story of Ducombe's escape. Starvation drove him to the house of a friend. The friend was out, and when the wife asked who he was, Ducombe laid his revolver on the table and made answer. I am Ducombe, and I must have food. Here he lay disguised so completely with nightcap nightdress, and all, as the visiting grandmother of the family, that loyalist who saw his white horse and came in to search the house, looked squarely at the recumbent figure beneath the bedclothes and did not recognize him. 
to come at last reached his sister's home near london don't you know me he asked standing in the open door waiting for her recognition in the few weeks of exposure and pursuit his hair had turned snow white his friends suggested that he cross to the american frontier dressed as a woman and the disguise was so perfect curls of his sister's hair bobbing from beneath his bonnet that two loyalist soldiers gallantly escorted the lady's sleigh across unsafe places in the ice ducombe waited till he was well on the american side and his escorts on the way back to sarnia then he emitted a yell over the back of the cutter go tell your officers you have just helped dr ducombe across having lost the fight for a cause which events have since justified it is not surprising that the patriots on the american frontier now lost their heads they formed organizations from detroit to vermont for the evasion of canada and the establishment of a republic these bands were known as hunters lodges rolfe and decom repudiated connection with them but mackenzie was head and heart for armed invasion from buffalo space forbids the story of these raids they will fill a book with such thrilling tales as made up the border wars of scotland the tumultuous year of eighteen thirty seven closed with the burning of the caroline mackenzie had taken up quarters on navy island in niagara river the caroline an american ship was being employed to convey guns and provisions to the insurgents camp on the canadian side of the river camp allen mcnab with twenty five hundred loyalist troops looking across the river with field glasses mcnab sees the boat landing field guns on navy island for mackenzie i say exclaims the future sir allen this won't do can't you cut that vessel out drew addressing a young officer nothing easier answers drew do it then orders mcnab in spite of the fact nothing was easier drew's men came near disaster on their midnight escapade the river below navy island was three miles wide and only a mile and a half from the rapids above the falls with a current like a mill race secretly seven boats with four men in each set out at half past eleven a few friends on the river bank wishing drew godspeed out from shore drew draws his boats together and tells the men the perilous tasks they have to do if any one wishes to go back let him do so now not a man speaks halfway across firing from the island drives two of the boats back the rest get under shadow from the bright moonlight and go on the roar of the falls now become deafening and some of the rowers call out they are being drawn down the center of the river astern drew fastens his eyes on a light against the american shore to judge of their progress for a moment though the men were rowing with all their might the light ashore and the boats in mid-river seemed to remain absolutely still finally the boats gained an oar's length then a mighty pull and all forge ahead a strip of land hides approach to the caroline the canadian boatmen lie in hiding till the moon goes down then glide in on the caroline when drew mounts the decks three unarmed men are found on the shore side drew orders them to land one fires point blank drew slashes him down with a single saber cut the rest of the crew are roused from sleep and sent ashore the caroline is set on fire in four places she is moored to the shore ice axes chop her free she is adrift drew the last to jump from her flaming decks to his place in the small boats the flames are seen from the canadian side and huge bonfires light up the canadian shore by their gleam drew steers back for mcnab's army and is welcomed with cheers that split the welkin slowly the flaming vessel drifted down the channel to the falls 
Suddenly the lights went out. The Caroline had either sunk on a reef or gone over the falls. One man had been killed on the decks. As the vessel was American and had been raided in American ports, the episode raised an international dispute that might in another mood have caused war. Lote and Matthews pay for the rebellion on the gallows, upon which the imperial government expressed regret that the Toronto executive found such severity necessary. Later, when the hunters' lodges raid Prescott and Van Schultz, the Polish leader, with nine others, is executed at Kingston, a great revulsion of feeling takes place against the family compact. The execution of the Patriots did more for their cause than all their efforts of twenty years. The Canadian people had supported the agitators up to the point of armed rebellion. That gave British blood pause, for the Britisher reveres the law next to God. But when the governing ring began to glut its vengeance under cloak of loyalty, that was another matter. After the execution of Lount and Matthews, the family compact could scarcely count a friend outside its own circle in Upper Canada. It is worth remembering that the young lawyer who defended Van Schultz in the trial at Kingston was John A. Macdonald, who later took foremost part in framing a new constitution for Canada. End of section 45 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 46 of Canada, The Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, The Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1820 to 1867, Part 3 Affairs had gone faster in Quebec. There the rebellion almost became war. Papineau was leader of the agitators. Papineau, fiery, impetuous, eloquent, followed by the bold boys in the bonnets blue, marching the streets of Montreal, singing revolutionary songs and planting liberty trees. In Lower Canada, too, things have come to the pass where the agitators advocate armed resistance. From the first, in Quebec, the struggle has waged round two questions, the exclusion of the French from the Council and the right of the colony to spend its own revenues, but boil down the 92 resolutions of 1834 and the demands of the agitators in Lower Canada are the same as in Upper Canada for complete self-government. A dozen clashes of authority lead up to the final outbreak. For instance, the House elects Papineau, the agitator, speaker. The Governor-General refuses to recognize him, and Parliament is dissolved. Failing to obtain redress by constitutional methods, the agitators now advocate the right of a colony to abolish government unsuited to it. The Constitutional Party takes alarm and organizes volunteers. Papineau's party, early in 1837, began violently advocating that all French magistrates resign their commissions from the English government. On Richaud River and up in two mountains, north of Montreal, are the strongholds of the agitators, where men have been drilling, and the boys in the bonnets blue rioting through the villages to the great scandal of parish priests. There are riots in Montreal early in November of 1837, and the Sons of Liberty are chased through the town. Then in the third week of November, a troop of Montreal cavalry is sent to St. John's to arrest three agitators who have been threatening a magistrate for refusing to resign his commission. 
the agitators are arrested and handcuffed and at three in the morning the troops are moving along across country towards longueuil with the prisoners in a wagon when suddenly three hundred armed men rise on either side of the road to the fore shots are exchanged in the confusion the prisoners jump from the wagon this is not resistance to authority it is open rebellion papineau entrusts the management of affairs in saint eustache north of montreal to girard a swiss and to dr chenier a local patriot papineau himself and dr nelson and o'callaghan are down on the richelieu at st denis take the richelieu region first colonel gore is to strike up the river southward to st denis colonel wetherill is to cross country from montreal and strike down the river north to st charles thus hemming in the insurgents between gore on the north and himself on the south there are eight hundred rebels at st denis one hundred and fifty armed and twelve hundred at st charles papineau and o'callaghan for safety's sake slip across the line to swanton in vermont one could wish that having led their faithful followers up to the sticking point of stark madness the agitators had remained shoulder to shoulder with the brave fellows on the field colonel gore came from montreal by boat to the mouth of the richelieu at seven thirty on the night of november twenty second two hundred and fifty troopers landed to march up the richelieu road to st denis rain turning to sleet was falling in a deluge the roads were swimming knee-deep in slush bridges had been cut and in the darkness the loyalists had to diverge to fording places which lengthened out the march twenty-four miles at st denis was dr nelson with the agitators in a three-story stone house windows bristling with muskets by dawn papineau and o'callaghan had fled and at nine o'clock came colonel gore's loyalist troops exhausted from the march soaked to the skin their water sag clothes freezing in the cold wind the loyalists went into the fight unfed and with a whoop but it is not surprising that the peppering of bullets from the windows drove the troopers back and gore's bugles sounded retreat unaware of gore's defeat one lieutenant weir has been sent across country with dispatches he is captured and bound and in a futile attempt to escape shot and stabbed to death wetherill comes down the river from chamblay with three hundred men he finds st charles village protected by outworks of felled trees and the houses are literally loopholed with muskets but wetherill has brought cannon along and the cannon begin to sing on november twenty fifth then wetherill's men charge through the little village with leveled bayonets the poor habitants scatter like frightened sheep they surrender one hundred perish it is estimated that on both sides three hundred are wounded though some english writers give the list of wounded as low as forty messengers gallop with news of the patriots defeat at st charles to dr nelson at st denis the habitants fled to their homes nelson was left without a follower he escaped to the woods and for two weeks wandered in the forests of the boundary exposed to cold and hunger not daring to kindle a fire that would betray him afraid to let himself sleep for fear of freezing to death he was captured near the vermont line and carried prisoner to montreal and still worse fared the fortunes of war with the patriots north of montreal their defense and defeat were almost pitiable in childish ignorance of what war might mean boys marbles had been gathered together for bullets scythes were carried as swords and old flintlocks that had not seen service for twenty years were taken down from the chimney places 
with their bonnets blue hanging down their backs, rusty firearms over their shoulders, and the village fiddler leading the march, one thousand sons of liberty had paraded the streets of St. Eustache, singing, rollicking, speechifying, unconscious as children, playing war that they were dancing to ruin above a volcano. Chenier, the beloved country doctor, is their leader. Girod, the Swiss, has come up to show them how to drill. They take possession of a newly built convent. Then on Sunday, the 3rd of December, comes word of the defeat down on the Richelieu. The moderate men plead with Chenier to stop now before it is too late. But Chenier will not listen. He knows the cause is right, and with the credulity or faith of a simple child hopes some mad miracle will win the day. Still he is much moved. Tears stream down his face. Then on December 14th the church bells ring a crazy alarm. The troops are coming, two thousand of them from Montreal under Sir John Colburn, the governor. The insurgent army melts like frost before the sun. Less than one hundred men stand by poor Chenier. At eleven thirty the troops sweep in at both ends of the village at once. Girard, the Swiss commander, suicides in panic flight. Cooped up in the church steeple with the flames mounting closer round them and the troopers whooping jubilantly outside, Chenier and his eighty followers call out, We are done, we are sold, let us jump. Chenier jumps from the steeple, is hit by the flying bullets, and perishes as he falls. His men cower back in the flaming steeple till it falls with a crash into the burning ruins. Amid the ash heap are afterwards found the corpses of seventy-two patriots. The troopers take one hundred prisoners in the region, then set fire to all houses where loyalist flags are not waved from the windows. Matters have now come to such an outrageous pass that the British government can no longer ignore the fact that colony has been goaded to desperation by the misgovernment of the ruling clique. Lord Durham is appointed special commissioner with extraordinary powers to proceed to Canada and investigate the whole subject of colonial government. One may guess that the ruling clique were prepared to take possession of the new commissioner and prime him with facts favorable to their side. But Durham was not a man to be monopolized by any faction. When he arrived in May of 1838, he quickly gave proof that he would follow his own counsels and choose his own counselors. His first official declaration was practically an act of amnesty to the rebels. Eight only of the leading prisoners, among them Dr. Nelson, being punished for banishment to Bermuda, the rest being simply expelled from Canada. This act was tantamount to a declaration that the rebels possessed some rights and had suffered real grievances, and the government rings in both Toronto and Quebec took furious offence. Complaints against Durham poured into the English colonial office. Complaints, oddly enough, that he had violated the spirit of the English constitution by sentencing subjects of the crown without trial. Though everyone knew that in Canada's turbulent condition, trial by jury was impossible. Durham's political foes in England took up the cry. In addition to political complaints were grudges against Durham for personal slight, and it must be confessed that the haughty Earl had ridden roughshod over all the petty prejudice and little dignities of the colonial magnates. The upshot was, Durham resigned in high dungeon and sailed for England in November of 1838. On his way home, he dictated to his secretary, Charles Buller, the famous report which is to Canada what the Magna Charta is to England or the Declaration of Independence to the United States. Without going into detail, it may be said that it recommended 
complete self-government for the colonies. As disorders had again broken out in Canada, the English government hastened to embody the main recommendations of Duren's report in the Union Act of 1840, which came into force a year later. By it, Upper and Lower Canada were united on a basis of equal representation each, though Quebec's population was 600,000 to Ontario's 500,000. The colonies were to have the entire management of their revenues and civil lists. The government was to consist of an upper chamber appointed by the crown for life, a representative assembly, and the governor with a cabinet of advisers responsible to the assembly. In all, more than 700 arrests had been made in Quebec province. Of these, all were released but some 130, and the state trials resulted in sentence of banishment against fifty, death to twelve. In modern days it is almost impossible to realize the degree of fanatical hatred generated by this half-century of misgovernment, declared one of the governing clique's official newspapers in Montreal. Peace must be maintained, even if we make the country a solitude. French Canadians must be swept from the face of the earth. The empire must be respected, even at the cost of the entire French Canadian people. With such sentiments openly uttered, one may surely say that the Constitutional Act of 1791 turned back the pendulum of Canada's progress fifty years, and it certainly took fifty more years to, to eradicate the bitterness generated by the era of misgovernment. With the Upper and Lower Canadas united in a federation of two provinces, it was a foregone conclusion that all parts of British North America must sooner or later come into the fold. It would be hard to say from whom the idea of a federation of all the provinces first sprang. Purely a theory, the idea may be traced back as early as 1791. The truth is, destiny, providence, or whatever we like to call that great stream of concurrent events which carries men and nations out to the ocean highway of a larger life, forced British North America into the Confederation of 1867. In the first place, while the Union worked well in theory, it was exceedingly difficult in practice. Ontario and Quebec had equal representation. One was Protestant, the other Catholic. One French, the other English. Deadlocks, or, to use the slang of the street, even tugs of war, were inevitable and continual. All Ontario had to do to thwart Quebec or Quebec had to do to thwart Ontario, was stand together and keep the vote solid. Coalition ministries proved a failure. In the second place, Ontario was practically dependent on the customs duties collected at Quebec ports of entry for a provincial revenue. The goods might be billed for Ontario. Quebec collected the tax. Ontario was also dependent on Quebec for access to the sea which province was to pay for the system of canals being developed and the deepening of the St. Lawrence. Then the Oregon Treaty of 1846 had actually brought a cloud of war on the horizon. In case of war, there was the question of defense. Then railways had become a very live question. Quebec wanted connection with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. How was the cost of a railroad to be apportioned? Red River was agitating for freedom from fur trade monopoly. How were railways to be built to Red River? Ontario's population in twenty years jumped past the million mark. Was it fair that her million people should have only the same number of representatives as Quebec with her half million? Reformers of Ontario voiced by George Brown of the Globe called for rep by pop, representation by population. 
civil war was raging in the United States, threatening to tear the Union to tatters. Why? Because the balance of power had been left with the state's governments and not enough authority centralized in the federal government. The lesson was not lost on struggling Canada. England's declaration of free trade brought the colonies face to face with the need of some united action to raise revenue by tariff. Then the Hudson's Bay Company's license of monopoly over the fur trade of the West was nearing expiration. Should the license be renewed for another twenty years, or should Canada take over Red River as a new province, which was the wish of the people both East and West? And if Canada did buy out the Hudson's Bay Company's vested rights, who was to pay down the cost? Lastly was John A. Macdonald, the young lawyer who had pleaded the defense of the Patriot Trials at Kingston in 1838, now a leading politician of the United Canadas, weary of the hopeless deadlocks between Ontario and Quebec, with almost a sixth sense of divination in reading the signs of the times in the trend of events, John A. Macdonald saw that Canada's one hope of becoming a national power lay in union, confederation. The same thing was seen by other leaders of the day, by all that grand old guard known as the Fathers of Confederation sent from the different provinces to the conference at Quebec in October of 1864. There the outline of what is known as the British North America Act was drafted, in the main but the amplification of Durham's scheme, made broad enough to receive all the provinces whenever they might decide to come into confederation. The delegates then go back to be endorsed by their provinces, by some provinces the scheme is rejected. Newfoundland is not yet part of Canada, but by 1867 Confederation is an accomplished fact. By 1871 the New Dominion has bought out the rights of the Hudson's Bay Company in the West, and Manitoba joins the Eastern Provinces. By 1885 a railway links British Columbia with Nova Scotia. By 1905, the great hunting field of the Saskatchewan prairies has been divided into two new provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta, each larger than France. Such is barest outline of Canada's past. What of the future for this empire of the north? That future is now in the making. It lies in the hands of the men and women who are living today. In the past, Canada's makers dreamed greatly, and they dared greatly, and they took no heed of impossibles, and they spent without stint of blood and happiness for high aim. When Canada lost ground in the progress of the nations, as in the corrupt days of Bigot's rule during the French regime, or the equally corrupt days of the family compact after the conquest, it was because the altar fires of her ideals were allowed to burn low. It has been said that the past is but a rear light marking the back trail of the ship's passage. Say rather it is the searchlight on the ship's prow, pointing the way over the waters. Today Canada is the very vanguard of the nations. Her wheat fields fill the granaries of the world, and to her ample borders come the peoples of earth ends, bringing tribute not of incense and frankincense as of old, but of manhood and strength, of push and lift, of fire and hope and enthusiasm, and the daring that conquers all the difficulties of life, bringing too all the outworn vices of an old world all the vicious instincts of the powers that prey in the underworld. Canada's prosperity is literally overflowing from a cornucopia of superabundant plenty. Will her constitution, wrested from political and civil strife, will her moral stanima 
bred from the heroism and a heroic past stand the strain the tremendous strain of the new conditions will she assimilate the strange new peoples strange in thought and life and morals coming to her borders will she eradicate their vices like the strong body of a healthy constitution throwing off disease or will she be poisoned by the toxins of vicious traits inherited from centuries of vicious living will she remake the men regenerate the aliens coming to her hearth fire or will they drag her down to their degeneracy above all will she stand the strain the tremendous strain of prosperity and the corruption that is attendant on prosperity queen sab let her answer who can and the question is best answered by watching the criminal calendar is the percentage of convictions as certain as relentless as under the old regime what manner crimes is growing up in the land and the question may be answered too by watching whether the press and platform and pulpit stand as everlasting and relentless for sharp demarcation between right and wrong for the sharp demarcation between truth plain truth and intentional mediocrity as under the regime of the old hard days when political life grows corrupt it is now cleansed or condoned let each canadian answer for himself if the altar fires of canada's ideals again burn low again she will lag in the progress of the world's great builders end of section 46 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. End of Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Long.